today's speaker is Alison Towner. She did undergrad here at University of Arizona. Um, it's wonderful to see her again. And then from here, she moved to Virginia and she uh, worked on a thesis with Crystal Brogan. Uh, she's working on early stages of star formation and um, pre-stellar course too, right? Uh, in the high-mass star formations. And then now she's a postdoc in the University of Florida. So welcome, and we'll, we'll hear your uh, IMA program, IMA, IMA, uh, large program. Thank you. Um, for those of you in the room, do you mind if I take my mask off? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming and thank you everyone for coming online. Um, if anyone online has trouble hearing me, please um, put, a, put a note in the chat, um, but I will try to speak sufficiently loudly. Um, Go ahead, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm, today I'm going to be talking about the Alma IMF Large Program which is a program to explore um, the massive star formation in 15 of the most massive regions in the Milky Way galaxy, and in particular, to determine whether the core mass function, the distribution of masses of pre and protostellar cores um, in these regions changes with time. And I will be discussing first results from these CMF studies papers that have been submitted and are currently under review. And I'll also be discussing my own work looking at the silicon monoxide, the SIO gas uh, in all 15 of these regions. Um, so we will start with some context and an overview of the project in general, um, move on to early results of the CMF studies, um, the submitted papers, um, and then the SIO gas that has been identified to be part of protostellar outflows and um, a, then finish up with a significant amount of non-outflowing SIO gas in the J equals five to four transition. Um, so starting with context and the project overview, um, the core mass function is the distribution of masses of pre and protostellar cores in a star forming region. The, the number of potential star forming cores that exist at each mass. Um, it's very analogous in conceptually to the stellar initial mass function. And some have argued that the CMF is the direct precursor to the IMF, the IMF inherits its shape from the CMF. Um, the Saul-Peter Saul IMF is found to have a slope of negative 1.35 at high masses, at a high mass end. But the formation process of high mass stars is not completely understood. And in particular, there are sort of two main paradigms for how we think high mass star formation might occur. The first is that it is simply a, a, a scaled up version of low mass star formation. The mass of the star is inherited directly from the mass of the self-gravitating uh, core, the, the self-gravitating sphere of dust and gas that is undergoing gravitational collapse to form a star. Um, the alternate paradigm is that environmental properties might actually matter more, specifically at the high mass end. The mass of a star might not be inherited directly from the mass of its form star forming core alone. There might be additional mass deposited onto the star from um, filamentary flows, for instance. Determining the core mass function can help us um, determine the origins of the IMF in general and of uh, high mass stars as a group. If high mass star formation proceeds purely as a scaled up version of low mass star formation, then you should expect the core mass function to have the same shape as the CMF. If it doesn't, that indicates there might be other processes at play. Um, Unfortunately, as with everything else in astronomy since the beginning of time, CMF studies have not been entirely consistent. So people have been looking at core mass functions in high mass star forming regions for quite some time. And some studies find that CMFs in high mass star forming regions, high mass protoclusters, um, have slopes that are very similar to the Salt-Peter slope, 
within their statistical uncertainties um, at the high mass end. So they find that the CMF has slopes of about negative 1.35 um, or in the, you know, negative 1.4 in the case of W51. Um, but other studies have found that the CMF at the high mass end is shallower than Salpeter, which in the context of these plots as they are being um, displayed on this particular uh, graph, what that means, what a shallower slope means is that there are more stars at the high mass end, more protostars at the high mass end. Um, so on the x-axis, you have core mass, the mass of the star forming core. On the y-axis, is the number of cores at each mass. A saltpeter-like slope um, is demonstrated here by the red uh, histogram, and the shallower slope is closer to a, a straight line, a flat line um, for W43MM1, um, which was found to have a CMF slope that simply is not, um, not in agreement with saltpeter uh, within statistical uncertainties. So this conflict in the data was um, part of the motivation for the ALMA IMF large program. Uh, ALMA IMF has selected 15 high mass star forming regions um, between two and six kiloparsecs from Earth. These are among the most massive star forming regions in the galaxy. And these targets were selected to span a range of evolutionary stages. So each protocluster was assigned an evolutionary stage based on its um, millimeter emission and its, its uh, luminosity to mass ratio. Luminosity to mass ratio, L over M, is generally considered a, a good guidepost of evolutionary state because it should increase with time. Um, the mass of a protocluster is not going to change that much over time, but the luminosity should increase as more and more stars reach the main sequence. Um, so ALMA IMF targeted uh, 15 protoclusters with four to six protoclusters in each evolutionary stage, the evolutionary stages were young, intermediate, and evolved. Evolved are regions where you are starting to get significant photoionizing radiation from H2 regions. Young protoclusters are protoclusters that have some, some forming stars, but um, no evidence of significant um, past generations of star formation. So the sample was selected um, specifically to be massive and luminous. The sample spans uh, two and a half to 33,000 solar masses for the uh, full protoclusters and six to 700,000 uh, solar luminosities. And the methods employed were multifaceted. So um, core identification, uh, dust properties of, of the star forming cores were done with one and three millimeter continuum data, um, mass sensitivities down to about half a solar mass in, uh, when those data are combined. Um, and then a wide range of molecular tracers to study different processes. So gas infall being studied with, with CO2 to one and N2H plus protostellar outflows studied with CO, SIO, SO, um, all of the usual suspects for gas temperature, methyl cyanide, methanol, um, and then some turbulence tracers, as well as um, all, all the IMF specifically targeted recombination lines in these fields in order to be able to identify young nascent H2 regions um, by their recombination line emission in um, ALMA band three and band six. So that is the overview of ALMA IMF. And let us discuss the early results of the question of whether CMF varies with time. So Johan Pluto is a, a graduate student in France and he has divided um, two of the regions, W43, MM2 and MM3 into subregions based on the in, essentially inflection points in the, the spatially decomposed one and three millimeter continuum data. And each subregion was classified based on its 
overall star formation activity. It is highly active, it is poor, you know, low activity, low star formation activity. And then what Johan has done is derived a core mass function for each subregion individually. Um, this is a particularly valid approach for this combination of regions because MM2 and MM3 have some of the most, um, the largest core populations of, of any regions in our sample. Um, some of the largest. And what he has found is that CMF slopes <clears throat> in the subregions are most saltpeter like for subregions with the least star formation activity. And they're the least saltpeter like in regions with the most star formation activity, which seems to suggest, it certainly suggests CMF variation with time. It also suggests that it is specifically during a starburst phase that the CMF flattens. Um, so here you can see um, Johan's results for both um, regions with low star formation activity, which are these um, three colored lines in the bottom left, and the black line is the CMF for all subregions combined, so the, the, the full protostellar population in W43, MM2, and MM3. Um, and these are reasonably saltpeter-like uh, within, within uncertainties, whereas uh, the CMFs for regions with high star formation activity simply are not, uh, simply are not in agreement with saltpeter. Um, and they're also significantly shallower than the overall, the aggregate population in, in W43 as well. Um, so that's certainly a very tantalizing result. Um, can we learn anything more from W43? Uh, Toma Noni is a postdoctoral associate uh, working with Roberto Galvan Madrid down in Morelia, Mexico, and down at UNAM. And Toma has used uh, CO outflows, carbon monoxide outflows, um, to identify protostellar cores in W43, MM2, and MM3 and separate them from the prestellar core populations or the, the, you know, the population of course with, with no protostellar outflows. And then examined the CMFs for those two populations separately. So the, proto, the, the population of cores with protostellar outflows must be actively accreting, must be actively gaining in mass. Um, whereas the, the population of cores with no outflows um, is not undergoing that process yet. And uh, this is uh, one of the figures from Tomas' paper, Noni et al. 2022, uh, which has been submitted and showing, showing the CO outflows as used to identify specific uh, protostellar or candidates. And what Tomas has found is that prestellar cores have a CMF slope that is quite consistent with saltpeter. And the protostellar cores in this region have a CMF slope, again, that is simply not compatible with saltpeter, um, which again suggests that the population of star forming cores that are actively accreting, actively growing in mass is, uh, is essentially top heavy, um, more high mass stars protostars than low mass protostars. Um, what has been suggested by these papers combined and referencing each other, they, they have both been submitted, um, is essentially that the slope of the core mass function starts out quite saltpeter-like. It gets shallower as a massive star forming region undergoes a starburst event. It forms a lot of high mass stars um, in a short period of time or comparatively short period of time and proportionally fewer low mass stars. And then after the peak of the starburst has been passed, star formation continues in the cloud, but it continues pretty much only for low mass protostars. And so you, you are top heavy during a starburst and then you fill in the low mass end and return to a saltpeter-like slope. 
as I said, both of these papers have been submitted. They're both under review. I believe both have had comments returned. So um, uh, revisions for each draft are, are ongoing. Um, and if you're at all interested in this topic, I encourage you to look, look at these papers. And if you're hiring to keep Toma, I know Toma is on the job market this year. Johan is still a graduate student, but will be on the job market in a few years. So um, keep your eye on them. Um, so now I will move on to the work that I've been doing um, while I've been working on the Alma IMF project, which is um, specifically the SIO gas in, in all 15 fields. Um, this project started out purely as a uh, SIO outflow catalog project, and then um, we discovered unexpected results and properties, and it became multiple projects. Um, so I will discuss the SIO gas in outflows first, um, and then talk about the low velocity, the non-outflowing SIO gas that we see as well. Um, so my goal for the SIO outflow catalog was to have a very SIO based method, which is to say um, an, it's not uncommon for protostellar outflow searches to start with driving sources. So you start with, with the continuum cores and then you look for outflows around them. Um, and I really wanted this to be based on what the SIO gas is doing, describe, describe the full range of SIO activity. Um, so I did not require continuum driving sources for, um, in order to classify something as an outflow candidate. And I also don't perform a multi-species analysis. Um, that sort of analysis will be a very rich area of exploration, um, but we are starting with the, purely the SIO-based analysis and using that as a starting point for future analyses of these protostellar outflows. Um, I started by looking for linear high velocity features in masked moment maps of each region. Um, so this is an example from the ALMA IMF target G338.93. And in the integrated, the velocity weighted intensity map, the moment one map, um, we see a very strong outflow, a redshifted outflow, um, long, very high velocity, and then a somewhat shorter, um, but still very strong blue shifted outflow as well. There is a continuum peak here, right at the center where my, my pointer is, um, which is a, an excellent driving source candidate. I do not list driving source candidates in my paper presenting this catalog, but I did consult um, the continuum maps during, during this process, um, especially for foreign cases. Um, so I started by looking for linear high velocity features in the moment maps. And then once those features were identified, um, looking at their integrated spectra, trying to identify asymmetries in the spectra, which are indicative of um, their telltale sign of outflowing gas. Um, in this particular example, there's, as you can see, an extremely high velocity, um, you know, more than 50 kilometer per second um, redshifted outflow component, as well as a slightly lower, but still quite wide velocity range uh, blue shifted outflow component um, for this candidate. And also looking for telltale structure in PV diagrams. So position velocity diagrams tell you what velocity the gas is moving at, at different positions along an outflow axis. Um, so in this particular case, the path that I examined was essentially, you know, the middle of this black outline. Um, and it's very common for outflows to have telltale signatures such as um, large velocity shifts from significant, you know, high velocity red to high velocity blue, um, over a short uh, space, um, a short or a short physical distance, um, and sometimes for looped, looping um, or curved structures in PV diagrams can be indicative of internal structure within an outflow that might not necessarily be apparent to the naked eye, but but structures such as um, bow shocks and and sort of 
um, reverse shocks in, in the shocked gas. Um, and then finally, I performed a by eye examination of all line cubes to make sure that no um, potentially significant uh, emission was missed during this sort of map based process. Uh, and so what we find, uh, I have identified 319 outflow candidates across all 15 fields um, for a median of 17 candidates per field, but as few as three and as many as 41. Um, this is an extremely large sample of protostellar outflows. And in particular, it's a large homogeneous sample at core scale spatial resolution, which has been rarely done in massive star forming regions. Um, mostly because it's extremely difficult to do and requires high time commitments, such as a large program. Um, but what this means is that we can actually study populations of outflows, individual outflows within complete star forming regions. And so what we have is a, a complete um, catalog within our sensitivity limits within each field um, and each um, catalog covers the full field of view at 1.3 millimeters, um, the SIO line, the SIO J equal five to four line, which is what these data use, um, is in ALMA band six, and we do not have any complementary SIO data in band three. So the field of view is larger in band three, it's larger at three millimeters, but um, the catalog is limited to, to the one millimeter field of view. Um, we find that the derived properties of the, of the outflow populations are consistent with previous work for high mass star forming regions, in particular, uh, in particular Luke Mott's work um, using an RMS selected sample of sources and um, Walker Liu who examined massive protostellar outflows in the central molecular zone in actually a variety of tracers. Um, so we do find that our, our derived outflow mass, momentum, and energies are consistent with the literature with the caveat that these are um, three or four orders of magnitude in uh, spread. That is also consistent with the literature. <laughs> um, there's just a wide range of masses, momentum, and energies. Um, we also determine the mass, momentum, and energy rates for each candidate. Uh, and this is done by taking um, the median velocity of each outflow, uh, dividing it, sorry, taking the, the length of each outflow, dividing it by its median velocity um, to extract a time scale, and then dividing the mass, momentum, and energy by that time scale. Um, so primarily for this work, what I've been interested in is aggregate outflow properties. Um, because this is a catalog project, um, I don't examine individual outflow candidates in detail, uh, but that certainly will be um, a component of future work. Um, but I do spend um, some time looking at population properties by field. And what I find is that there are strong correlations between these global outflow properties, the, the, the mass, the momentum, the energy that were um, presented on the previous slide, and uh, clump masses. Um, this is a correlation that's well established in the literature, primarily using single dish data, but we should expect that to be the same because single dish data are aggregating your emission over the whole protocluster. Um, what I think is more interesting is that the correlation becomes stronger when you compare the outflow properties to the total mass in cores. So instead of comparing outflow properties to essentially um, you know, all, all of the mass in the protocluster, including all of the ambient gas, the material available to be entrained in an outflow, when you compare the outflow properties to just the mass of potential driving sources, the correlations become much stronger. And 
I really want to stress that this correlation is present even without assigning outflows to specific driving sources. I have not taken any of my outflow candidates and assigned them to driving sources. I am not plotting out individual outflow mass versus individual driving source mass. These are aggregated properties. And so the fact that these correlations are still quite strong, even without performing that association, um, suggests that um, the, the mass of the driving source um, is more important to outflow properties than the properties of the entrained material, the, the ambient. Um, but Alma IMF was interested in the evolution of the CMF with time. So what can we learn about uh, our outflow properties with time? Do we see a change in global outflow properties with protocluster evolutionary stage? And we really do not. And in fact, um, all of these aggregate plots, I've performed both um, Spear Monroe and Kendall's Tau correlation tests on, on these um, data sets and I can only describe this as an aggressive lack of correlation uh, because the, the correlation coefficients themselves are, are more or less zero, but more importantly, the p-values are um, at or nearly at one, which is a 100% rejection of the possibility of correlation. Um, so this is quite a, a surprising result. Now, we have 319 outflow candidates, but we only have 15 fields, and I've aggregated these data into field by field. And so small number statistics does still need to be ruled out for this lack of correlation because we only have 15 points on these plots. Um, but what this may suggest is that um, you know, outflow properties are very strongly correlated with total mass and cores. But because we don't see any sort of trend with evolutionary state, this suggests that outflow properties are not really all that sensitive to starburst events. And we know that there are starburst events going on in these protoclusters. Um, possibly, uh, this is a methods issue, but I think the more intriguing possibility is that the outflow mass and momentum and energies remain dominated by the low mass protostellar population, even when comparatively larger numbers of high mass stars are being formed. Um, and so this is actually an area that I'm particularly interested to, to follow up on um, and, and has become part of my NSF application um, to, to explore what masses of protostars dominate the outflow feedback and whether this changes with time. And if it doesn't change with time, what does that tell us about the outflow feedback in massive star forming regions overall and how it affects the star forming uh, process? So on to the last topic, um, which is non-outflowing SIO gas in the ALMA IMF fields. Um, SIO, I have always been taught, is a shock tracer. It's a great shock tracer. SIO requires silicon in some form. Um, silicon and its compounds are found in dust, grain, mantles, and grain cores. Um, but there's certainly a lot more in the cores, and removing silicon from grain cores requires very energetic shocks. In other words, it requires high velocities, high collision velocities, and ideally heavy, heavy colliders so that you have the maximum possible momentum um, during the collision. And so your colliders would be um, atomic and molecular hydrogen, some helium, and then the occasional heavier atom. Um, these will be less abundant, but still present. Um, and what we find is that, um, so the, the sort of seminal work in this area was done by uh, Shilke et al. in 1997. Um, and what they found was that uh, core sputtering um, most significantly increases the amount of silicon and SIO in the gas phase. And so for this reason, this, this need to have high velocity collisions, SIO has long been considered a, a good tracer of shocks because you need, you need fast stuff, essentially. And 
that certainly is true. SIO is a very good shock tracer. But narrow line well, said, no, at, do it. at sorry. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, narrow line SAO, SAO at only at low velocities, so five kilometers a second or less, um, 10 kilometers a second or less, has been observed since at least the late 90s. Um, and it's been observed in both single dish and interferometric data and in um, a range of masses of star forming regions. And this material is. Um, quite clearly not outflowing and quite clearly doesn't have any telltale signatures of outflowing motion. So this is an example of some of the narrow line SIO from uh, the ALMA IMF target G008.67 um, is actually a region that has a hypercompact HG region in it. Um, but this, the green contours on this plot show um, only the low velocity emission. So the green contours are the integrated intensities between uh, plus and minus five kilometers a second from VLSR. And not only do we find some of this low velocity emission well separated from high velocity emission, but it has, it's quite narrow. It has no asymmetry to the line shape. And it has, it's essentially completely flat in the PV diagram. There's no indication that there's outflow occurring here. Um, in the ALMA IMF sample as a whole, we see this type of emission in every field. It has a full width half max of less than 10 kilometers a second always, usually less than six. It's always near VLSR. The, the narrow components don't show up uh, 20 kilometers a second away from VLSR is always near ambient velocities. It can be both coincident with outflows and independent of outflows. It's unclear if this is a line of sight effect or some direct physical connection, but certainly there it's not the case that the narrow line SAO requires a high velocity component as well. Um, it is typically elongated, not always. Sometimes there are examples of this low velocity emission that's just kind of an amorphous morphology, um, but often it will be elongated. There are two primary suggested origins for this low velocity SIO in the literature. The first is a low velocity model, um, primarily cloud cloud collisions, although um, turbulence in filaments as gas moves along a filament under the influence of gravity has also been suggested. Um, but in the low velocity model, the SIO is being, um, it, the fractional abundance of SIO in the gas phase is being increased purely through low velocity processes. No outflows need be invoked. And cloud cloud collisions are the, the primary low velocity process that, are, that is suggested. Um, and that's by Fabian Lubet, who is um, currently working on the, the CMF analysis for all 15 fields and all my IMF. Um, and Anna Duarte Cabral. And this theory suggests that there should be a decrease in the low velocity SIO fraction with time. You should see less and less of it over time because if you have a cloud cloud collision, two clouds collide, they start forming stars, they, they produce ubiquitously this low velocity SIO, but then as star formation proceeds, that gas gets repurposed or disrupted. You should see less and less of this low velocity material over time. Um, the alternate suggestion is that there are cooled or cooling outflows um, in these regions. And what we're seeing in the low velocity SIO is essentially relic shocks. These are, these are protostellar outflows that were high velocity They've experienced some form of cooling or physical drag from the ambient medium. They've slowed back down to ambient velocities, but the SIO is still abundant enough in the gas phase to be visible. Um, this has, was suggested by um, Kodea et al., and who are the earliest paper I can find um, uh, reporting this emission, as well as Min et al., 2016. Um, this hypothesis suggests 
evolution of the SIO gas within a single outflow. So if you could watch a single outflow for 10,000 years, you might see this process occur. But because it's really based on individual outflows, it's, it is difficult to predict global properties of the low velocity SIO in, in the protocluster um, from this particular theory. So what I have done is calculated uh, distance luminosities for both the high and the low velocity um, silicon monoxide in every field. And the distance luminosities for low velocity are the integrated flux density between plus or minus five kilometers a second of VLSR. And then the high velocity, uh, that flux density times um, distance squared. And the high velocity um, distance luminosities are between five and 95 kilometers a second, um, positive and negative. And compared both the absolute numbers and the fractional luminosities of each. And we find that the SIO distance luminosities are well correlated with clump and core masses. And this is also consistent with the aggregate outflow properties um, that I showed a few slides ago. Essentially, um, more is more, more or less. Um, you, as the luminosity of a clump increases, the total narrow line luminosity increases. Um, for each field, I calculate a lower and an upper limit to the narrow line luminosities based on the potential for contamination from emission that is actually from an outflow. Um, and so the, the dark green um, right, right side up triangles are the lower limits and the light green upside down triangles are the upper limits. Um, and we see some some correlation with volumetric luminosity, not as strong as with clump and core masses, but you can see as volumetric luminosity increases, there is some increase in the narrow line distance luminosity. But once again, we find that this low velocity SIO emission, much like the high velocity emission, is very poorly correlated with clump luminosity to mass ratio. And Recall that clump luminosity to mass ratio is our proxy for evolutionary state. So the fact that we don't see a correlation between um, the narrow line luminosity and clump L over M suggests that there isn't an evolutionary change with this emission. Um, additionally, SIO luminosity fractions are not correlated with any clump properties. So what I was showing on this slide is, is total SIO distance luminosities, but SIO luminosity fraction is the narrow line component divided by the total, right? And if the low velocity cloud cloud collision hypothesis is correct, it predicts that there should be proportionally less and less and less narrow line SIO, um, low velocity SIO as time goes on but we really don't see any such correlation, any such decrease with evolutionary state um, in these plots. So, Louvet et al. 2016 did show um, quite thoroughly that you, you can use um, low velocity processes alone to reproduce the low velocity SIO that they see in their field. Um, it was a study of a single field, and when we look at the full population of all my IMF fields, we, we don't really see the change with evolutionary state that we would expect. That doesn't mean it's impossible that low velocity processes are present, though. In particular, there is a third suggestion um, by Ana Duarte Cabral, which is that actually the low velocity SIO is tracing both low and high velocity processes, that um, the SAO was released in a high velocity process following, um, you know, following the, the scenarios modeled by Shilka in 1997. But so you need the high velocity process to release the SIO in the first place, but you can possibly maintain it in the gas phase, keep it from um, dropping out down to very low fractional abundances, purely by low velocity processes. So you require 
a protocellar outflow, for instance, to release the SIO into the gas phase or produce the SIO in the gas phase. But then low velocity shocks from, you know, ambient turbulence, gravitationally induced turbulence, um, turbulence in dense gas is enough to keep the SIO in the gas phase in significant enough amounts to be visible. Um, this is very much an area of active research. Um, answering this question, I think, will require both uh, multi-line data analysis and um, consultation with astrochemical simulation work and hydrodynamical simulation work. Um, we have been in contact with Stella Offner and David Gujanov, uh, who have created the Starforge simulation, um, and we think that there will be some um, Good crossover between those two projects. We think that that their project can inform this question uh, quite significantly. Uh, this will be a separate paper in next year, um, but this is, I think, a very fascinating topic and suggests that low velocity SIO either could be used to um, to give us a lifetime for the high velocity, you know, the truly high velocity component of protostellar outflows if it's tracing relic outflows, or it could be um, an excellent tracer of turbulence in dense gas because SIO J equals five to four specifically requires gas uh, above a density of 10 to the four per centimeter cubed, usually 10 to the five per centimeter cubed is, is the common assumption, um, which is precisely the gas most likely to start collapsing and forming stars. Um, so it could, it would, in that case, if it's tracing low velocity processes, primarily um, in just the ambient gas, it, it would be a novel tracer of, of turbulence in, in the gas, most likely to start fragmenting and forming stars. Um, so just uh, to end, ALMA IMF has a number of publications in print and forthcoming. So um, Mott et al. 2022 is paper one. That's the, the overview and first results. Um, Ginsburg et al. 2022 is the, the continuum data release and um, description of the data reduction process. And Natalie Brulette has also published uh, a paper on hot cores in W43MM1 specifically. Um, in addition to the papers by Johan Puto and Tomon Noni that I discussed earlier, we also have a number of papers um, to be imminently submitted. Um, the SIO outflow catalog paper, the line data release and description of the data reduction process, um, and core extraction for all 15 fields, and um, an examination of, of CH3O, CHO for um, all 15 fields as well as a, as a hot core analysis. So with that, um, thank you all for, for coming, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Samantha. Okay, awesome. This is so cool. Um, I was wondering if you saw, if you looked at the methanol and if that traced the SIO or anything or follows a similar pattern as, as it. Uh, yeah, or what the methanol is doing. <laughs> Just <laughs> curious. <laughs> um, I personally have not examined the methanol. Um, the team members who are studying hot cores, I know, have taken a look at it, but they've primarily been looking at it in the context of temperature fitting for cores. Okay. Um, I have not compared it to the extended SIO emission. That's certainly a, a very intriguing suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, as, as Serena and I were discussing earlier, um, determining the origin of the low velocity SIO, you can come at it from two directions. You can um, compare it, its location, its morphology and its kinematics to other tracers of turbulence and dense gas. Um, or you can look for molecular species which are specifically enhanced in fast shocks and see if you see an enhancement of those, at, at, you know, spatially coincident with, with the low velocity SIO. Um, I have submitted a proposal for the latter strategy mm -hmm. um, to ALMA Cycle 9 um, and we'll resubmit in the spring. <laughs> um, and, but the turbulence... Um, we can probably do sort of in-house essentially with the existing all IMF data. Um, it hasn't been done yet. 
once the line data are released, a number of comparisons will become a bit easier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. Cool. And uh, I'm excited about the what a methyl formate uh, will be cool. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. So for those elongated um, SIO low velocity gas, is it possible they are just the outflows parallel to the plane of the sky? Um, it's certainly possible for some of them. The gas is so ubiquitous that, and so much of it is elongated that I think we would have to be, have a strangely high percentage of our outflows in the plane of the sky in order to explain the majority of that emission. John? Yeah, hello, Allison. Nice to hear you and have you here again. Um, I was wondering how you deal with the inclination angle, which is generally not known for the outflows in deriving their dynamical properties and the statistical analysis you use for your sample? Um, so the excellent question, um, excellent point. <laughs> we do not correct for inclination angle because it isn't known. Um, there are some, uh, I'm gonna forget the author name, but there, there has been an analysis done in the literature suggesting that, you know, correct all, um, all derived values by cosine i, where i is a specific, a specific angle, and you'll get closer to the truth on average. Um, but I, I have chosen not to do that for two reasons. One, if I'm gonna correct for inclination angle, I would rather do it properly for each individual outflow. And two, um, for the catalog paper specifically, what we're interested in are the correlations between the aggregated properties in each field. And the inclination angle will change the specific values of derived masses and derived momenta, et cetera, but shouldn't change the correlation. Look, it might move the line up or down, but shouldn't change the slope of the line. And so we have not done that correction I think anyone who's interested in using these data to do studies of specific candidates um, certainly will want to explore that, that avenue. Um, because of the goals of this particular paper, it wasn't as critical. Um, but no, it, it's an excellent point and certainly a point of no small amount of contention in the literature. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, any other question? Any more question? I have one question. I think I started talking about it uh, before this meeting, but um, so for the local, you know, nearby outflow sources, there are, are there enough, you know, very well resolved um, study of trace of those shocks and the velocities, like lowest velocity, high velocity compares for the outflow sources. So whether they detect those similar low velocity components for some of the uh, resolved sources in nearby Bulacan um, Cloud. Or SIO. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, first, the earliest paper I could find reporting low velocity SIO was looking at, at low mass regions. Um, I am not aware of anything approaching it, like a census of, of the um, immediate neighborhood. Um, but it certainly can be present in low mass regions. It's not exclusive to high mass regions. And we've primarily been comparing to high mass regions because of this, um, you know, this question of the specific circumstances of high mass star formation. Um, but for the low velocity SAO, mm -hmm. I think we will um, as we go further down that route, we will be comparing to low velocity regions as well. But unfortunately, I can't answer your question. Yeah, thank you. At the moment. Okay. Is there any other question from the Zoom audience? No. Okay. So then let's thank the listener again. Thank you.